Waiting is awkward. <clears throat> Do you agree with that? <clears throat> it's just awkward. We don't like it. We don't like to wait in lines. We don't like to wait on the phone. Uh, we don't like to wait for appointments. We don't like to wait, period. Uh, we don't, in fact, it, it's just frustrating, uh, irritating, even, even, even exasperating uh, at times. And yet, so much of your life is spent waiting. Just think about it. You wait nine months to be born, 16 years to drive a car, 18 years to vote, decades uh, to, to marry and, and start a family. In fact, your whole life is comprised of seasons of waiting. Truth of the matter is, everyone here is waiting for something. You're waiting for something. You may be in middle school and you're counting the days till you get out of middle school so you can be in high school. Or you're a, a senior and you're waiting to see if you're going to be accepted into that college you've always dreamed of. Or you're waiting to get a job. Or you're waiting to get into a house. Or you're waiting to get pregnant. Or if you're pregnant, you're waiting for a child. You're waiting to be married. You're waiting for your marriage to get better. Some of you are waiting for a promotion. You're waiting for a job change. You're waiting for your big break. You're waiting for a breakthrough. You're waiting for retirement. We're all waiting for something. So why does God make us wait? I mean, if he's a heavenly father and he loves us so much, then why does he just give us what we need when we need it? What, what's the waiting all about? I mean, is he playing games with us? Or is, is there a reason for the waiting? Well, that's what I want to talk about today, all right? So why don't you get your Bible? Why don't you open it up with me to Luke chapter 1. Luke chapter 1. We are starting a new series today called uh, Hope, uh, The Thrill of Hope. And today we're talking about hope when I'm waiting. And we're going to be looking at the Christmas story through the lens of hope. And we're going to find the story begins with a couple that's waiting. So let's look at it. Luke chapter 1, beginning at verse 5. This is the word of God. In the days of King Herod of Judea, there was a priest of Abijah division named Zechariah. His wife was from the daughters of Aaron. And her name was Elizabeth. Both were righteous in God's sight, living without blame according to all the commands and requirements of the Lord, but they had no children because Elizabeth could not conceive and both of them were well along in years. Now stop right there for just a minute. The Christmas story begins with this couple, Zechariah and Elizabeth. Now, they're an important couple, but we really don't know a whole lot about them other than what we learn just right here in these first few verses. We learn that both of them were of the priestly line. Both of them were descendants of Aaron. Zechariah was a priest of the division of Abijah. Elizabeth was also of the priestly line. And uh, in fact, her name, Eli uh, Shabbat, means uh, the Lord's oath. Zechariah means the Lord remembers. So the couple together means the Lord remembers his oath. And that would be very important as you read their story together. Not only were they of the priestly line, but they were godly people. They loved the Lord. They were obedient to the Lord. They were doing everything right. They, they kept God's command to the letter. But there was a problem. They couldn't have children. She was barren. And they prayed to God to give them a child, and God had not answered that prayer. And now they are well along in years. Some scholars estimate 70, 80 years old. Way past childbearing age. And they had prayed and prayed and prayed, and yet God had not answered their prayer. They were waiting. Now listen, right off the bat, we're introduced to a couple 
who is doing everything right and yet still are waiting. You know, so many times we think, well, if God doesn't answer my prayer right away, then there's something wrong. I must have done something wrong. I, I, I'm, I'm the problem here that God doesn't quickly answer my prayer. But the, this couple was doing everything right, yet God delayed. God hadn't answered their prayer yet. Their prayer for a son year after year. Year after year, God give us a son. Year after year, I'm sure this desire was a great source of prayers. It was a source of a lot of doubts, a lot of tears, a lot of questions. Why isn't the Lord answering our prayer? But God was waiting for a reason. You know, if you take this couple and you pan back and see a bigger picture, really, the whole nation was waiting. Uh, we, we just finished studying Nehemiah, right? And you know that the, the children of Israel were in exile in Babylon and then they, a remnant came back to establish, reestablish Jerusalem and they rebuilt the wall. That's what the book of Nehemiah is all about. And they reestablished a temple and sacrifices and, and God renewed uh, Israel again, brought it again back to life. And yet over the course of time, the people became wayward again and their hearts turned distant from the Lord again and God sent them prophets again, just like he'd done before. But finally they come to the last prophet recorded in the Old Testament, the book of Malachi, and God predicts that there's going to be a season of waiting. And yet there would be one who would come at the end of it. In fact, in Malachi chapter 4 verse 2, it says, For you who revere my name, the son of righteousness will rise with healing in his rays. In other words, there's going to be a period of waiting but at the end of it, the son of righteousness will come. And that period of waiting started after Malachi's prediction. Israel waited for 400 years for God to move. Now think about that. 400 years. No word from God. No prophet of God. No angelic beings. No movement of God that they could see. 400 years years the whole nation was waiting and so let's pick up at verse 8 uh, when his division was on duty and he was serving as priest before God it happened that he was chosen by lot according to the custom of the priesthood to enter the sanctuary of the Lord and burn incense at the hour of incense the whole assembly of the people was praying outside an angel of the Lord appeared to him standing to the right of the altar of incense. Then Zechariah saw him, he was, when Zechariah saw him, he was terrified and overcome with fear. So Zechariah was one of about 18,000 priests, they estimate, at this time that were rotating their service in the temple. And so it was his time to rotate on and to serve in the temple. But there were, there were a special group of priests that were chosen by Lot to actually offer incense in the holy place. Now, if you remember, the temple was really a concentric boxes, if you will. There was an outer court, which they called the court of the Gentiles. Then the court inside of that was the court of women. And the inside of that was a court where uh, the Jewish men would gather and worship and where sacrifices were offered. But there was an inner court, an inner sanctum, if you will, called the Holy of Holies. Or sometimes it was called the Holy Place. And there, there was a menorah that burned all night. And there was a table with showbread on it. And there, there was a place to offer incense. And so certain priests were chosen by Lot to go in in the morning and the evening and offer incense to the Lord. And Zechariah's number came up. Zechariah got chosen. Not every priest got this. This was a high honor. It was a big deal to him. And so when he went in to offer incense, everyone outside is praying for this moment. This is as close to God as he could come on earth. And as he offered this incense, an angel appears to him. And just like that, the silence was broken. The 400 years of silence was broken. God was moving again. And look at what this angel said to him. Look at verse 13. The angel said to him, do not be afraid, Zechariah, because your prayer has been heard. Your wife, Elizabeth, will bear you a son, and you will name him John. And there will be joy and delight for you, and many will rejoice at his birth, 
For he will be great in the sight of the Lord and will never drink wine or beer. He will be filled with the Holy Spirit while still in his mother's womb. And he will turn many of the children of Israel to the Lord their God. And he will go before him in the spirit and power of Elijah to turn the hearts of the fathers to their children and the disobedient to the understanding of the righteous to make ready for the Lord a prepared people. This angel appeared to Zechariah and he gave him a promise that he was going to be a father, that he was going to have a son, and his son was going to be named John. Now later, this boy John would be called John the Baptist or John the Baptizer. And John's role was a very important role. He was to go before the Messiah. He was often called the forerunner, the one to go before, the one to announce that the Messiah had come. I've said this many times before, but all the prophets in the past had one message. The Messiah is coming. The Messiah is coming. John's message was the Messiah is here. There he is right there. Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. That was John's message. That was John's ministry. And he, and he said, you're going to be a dad, and your son is going to bring great delight and joy. Look at verse 16. He will go before the Lord in the spirit and the power of Elijah. Just as Elijah came and declared and pointed people to God in the same way your son is going to fulfill prophecy, and your son is going to come, and he's going to prepare the way for people to see him. But the thing I love about what the angel said to Zechariah the most is at the very beginning, he said, your prayer has been heard. Your wife Elizabeth will have a son. Your prayer has been heard. Now think about what that meant to him. All these years he's been praying and thinking heaven was ignoring him. All these years they've been praying, God give us a son. Lord, if, if please this year, Lord, please, whatever I have to do, God, is there anything that would hinder us from having a son? God, please, God, why? All these wrestlings with God at night pleading for God to give them a son. And he said, Zechariah, your prayer has been heard. And you will have a son. And you'll name him John. You know, I think a lot of times when we're waiting, a lot of times we feel like that, that God isn't listening. <laughs> or God doesn't care. Our prayers are just bouncing off the ceiling. God's not hearing me when I pray. But I want you to hear what uh, Zechariah heard uh, that day. He said, your prayer has been heard. If, if you belong to the Lord, if you've given your life to Christ, if you're seeking to please him, if you're seeking to walk with him as best you know how, then your prayer has been heard. Your prayer has not fallen on deaf ears. In fact, I love what 1 Peter 3.12 says, For the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous, and his ears are open to their prayer. The Lord hears you. You say, well, Craig, that's great, but if he hears me, then why doesn't he do something? If he hears me, then why am I still waiting? And I want you to write this down, okay? I want you to get a piece of paper out or, or maybe write it even in the margin of your Bible, okay? This is a really important statement. And this is really uh, the main idea of this passage. Here it is. God is working while you are waiting. God is working while you are waiting. In other words, don't, don't uh, mistake uh, waiting on your part as inactivity on God's part, all right? While, while you're waiting, he's working. He's working uh, while you're waiting. Just like the surgeon is working while you're in the waiting room. Just like your package is being loaded onto the Amazon Prime truck, right? While you're waiting on your front porch. God is working while you're waiting. I want you to receive that. God is working while you're waiting. You say, well, what, what's God doing? What's he working on? Well, let me give you a couple of things to write down, okay? Write this first thought down. God is working uh, on your faith. God is working on your faith. Did you know that your faith will never grow without waiting? Did you know that? Your faith won't ever grow. You won't ever 
increase in your faith. You won't get stronger in your faith without seasons of waiting. Your, your faith is like a muscle. It has to be strained. It has to be under pressure for it to grow. And the same thing is true uh, in your relationship with God. When, when you are under strain, when you are having to trust God in difficult situations, that's how God grows your faith. And it happens best in the waiting season. When you have to trust God and you don't see it happening, and then God comes through and you learn to trust him as you wait. Uh, this week, I, I got to talk to Tom and Nova. Tom and Nova uh, run a kind of a hunting and fishing lodge, and they told me this story about how they had worked at several other lodges before, and it wasn't just a good environment. They're both believers. There were a lot of, a lot of bad things happening in these lodges where they were working, and they said, we don't want to be a part of that. And so they believe God led them to buy this other lodge. And so they stepped out in faith, and they bought this lodge. The problem was they had a lodge, but they didn't have anybody to come to it yet. And so one morning over breakfast, Tom reached out his hands toward his wife, and she put her hands in his, and they prayed. And he said, I prayed a prayer something like this. He said, God, we believe that you've called us to buy this lodge but Lord, we're asking you to give us 10 groups of 10 people to come to our lodge this year in order for us to make it. Amen. And then they went on about their day. Little after lunch, a man walked in the door inquiring about some fishing in the area and they got to talk and sure enough, this man actually works for a Christian organization that brings believers to fish and hunt. And they sat down at the table and they started discussing. The man said to Tom, he said, Tom, it looks like I've got people, but I have no place. And you have a place, but you have no people. And then he leaned across the table and he said, how about this? How about if I could bring 10 groups of 10 men, would that work for you? And when Tom was telling me this story, he, he literally said, I I'm getting chills right now. He said, because I just prayed that specific prayer. And then in just a few hours, God brings some stranger into my shop and, and he's answering that specific prayer. Do you think that grew Tom's faith? Uh, somebody say yes. Absolutely. So it was in the waiting and having to trust God that God showed himself faithful and, and it grew Tom's faith to trust him again and then to trust him again and then to trust him again. That's how our faith grows. And so waiting is necessary to grow your faith. Now here's a big problem. Your clock and God's clock are not often synchronized right? Because your timing and his timing are often different, right? You come in and say, well, I'm going to do this, and I'm going to do this, and I'm going to do this, and I've got my whole life all planned out with all the little time spaces and time stamps that I'm going to make. And that's often not how God operates. God is the God of time. He is also the God of timing. And God is operating according to his clock and not yours. In fact, that's why Ecclesiastes uh, 3.11 says he makes everything beautiful in his time, not your time. And I think that's something that Zechariah and Elizabeth had to come to terms with, right? They've been praying in their, in their 20s for a child and in their 30s for a child and their 40s for a child. And by the time they got into their 50s and 60s, they're like, well, I guess we could pray, but I don't see how this is ever going to happen. And now here they are in their 70s and 80s, and now God's time has come to fruition. Why? Because John the Baptist had to be born at a certain point in time in order to be the forerunner of the Messiah. He wasn't hurting them. He wasn't punishing them. He was just preparing them for the right time, the right moment. Have you ever looked back in your life and you can see how God's timing was perfect? You ever done that? Like you look back in a situation and go, man, if, if we hadn't moved to this company, then I would have never met so-and-so that would never led to this other situation. And you look at it and go, wow, what looked to me is a bunch of jumbled mess. All of a sudden, man, I look back on it and I see that that was God's perfect timing. But here's what, you wanna, what I want you to understand is what you see looking back, God sees looking forward. God knows his perfect plan. 
And he knows his perfect timing. And so he puts us in seasons of waiting to grow our faith so we can trust him that he's at work at his perfect time. So what is God working on? Well, he's working on your faith. Here's another thing. He's also working on your patience. Everybody say the word patience. One, two, three. See, you can say the word, right? You can say the word. We, we don't like, we're like allergic to patience, right? Patience and perseverance. We don't want to talk about it. We don't want, I mean, we need it, but we don't want to talk about it. But listen, you must have patience and perseverance to grow in your walk with God. It's just a part of your spiritual growth. It is necessary for you. But the only way that you grow patience and the only way you grow perseverance is when you have something to be patient about and something to persevere through. And this is how God works in our lives. Let me just kind of illustrate it to you this way. Uh, remember back when uh, a movie came out, you had to go to a place that looked like this in order to see a movie. This is called a theater. <laughs> had a big screen in there. And so many times if you were anticipating this big blockbuster, you might get your friends together and all go to the theater. Or if, you know, you're kind of really on the edge, you might dress up as one of the characters of the movie. No, no shame here, not point fingers. You might dress up like Luke Skywalker or Batman or whatever, and you go see the movie, right? It was a big deal to go to the movie because that was the only place you could see a movie was at the theater, right? And then this company came out. Blockbuster. And now you don't have to go to the theater to see a movie. You can actually go to Blockbuster and rent a movie and take it home and watch it in your pajamas. How cool is that, right? And so now you're like, oh, cool. Now I don't have to go to the theater. Now I can, I can go in. I can watch as many times as you want as long as you do it within the three days that you rented it, right? Because then you get, you get charged extra if you delay it and you got to please be kind and rewind. Remember that? Oh, that's a flashback. Anyway, and, and, and so you, you did Blockbuster, but then another company came out called this. And remember, now you could go anytime you wanted. You go 24-7. It was always open, and you could go get your movie anytime you wanted. You have to wait for Blockbuster to be open. You could go anytime you wanted. But the problem was you had to get out of the house. You had to get in your car. You had to go to the place. Hopefully, they had one. They might be out, and then you'd be upset. Then you bang on the red box. Ah! And now, you don't even have to do that. Now you can just stream movies 24-7 on any device at any time. In fact, you could be watching a movie right now, and I, know, I wouldn't even know it, all right? <laughs> uh, you, just, you just watch movies, or you can binge watch all the movies that you want. It's all immediate. It's all instant. It's all now. It's all on demand. But here's the problem. God doesn't work on demand. He doesn't. And life doesn't work on demand. And what we need is to learn patience and perseverance and to not quit and to keep trusting and keep walking with God in the hard seasons of life. That's what we need. And I can remember seasons of life of waiting in my own life. And they were difficult. In fact, one of the things that is so difficult about waiting is that in the waiting period, a lot of ugly stuff starts bubbling up from within inside of us. Isn't that true? I mean, when you're waiting, when you, it's almost like the metalsmith that takes the ore and, and puts it in the fire, and then as it melts, all of a sudden the impurities come up to the top. Uh, when you are in the waiting period, all of a sudden all this stuff starts, starts rising up to the top, and you get angry with God. God, why aren't you answering? Or frustrated, or I want to quit, or I don't trust God anymore. I don't want to read my Bible. I mean, all these things start, I, I got to control things. I want to be in control. I'm impatient, I am unbelieving, I am all this stuff. I'm a hot mess. And all this stuff bubbles up to the surface and God does that in the waiting period so that he can surface it, he can remove it so that we can grow in our faith. You need patience and perseverance to walk the Christian life. And that means that a lot of things in life are not gonna come on demand. They're gonna come through waiting. In fact, I love what 
James 5 says. Let me just reference it right quick. Just listen to this. It's not on the screen. Just listen. James 5 verse 7. Be patient then, brothers and sisters, until the Lord's coming. See how the farmer waits for the land to yield its valuable crop, patiently waiting for the autumn and spring rains. You too be patient and stand firm. There may be somebody that needs to hear that. You too, be patient like the farmer. Trust God that he's developing patience and endurance in you and wait. What is God working on? God's working while you're waiting. He's working on your faith. Uh, He's working on your patience and perseverance. Let me give you one more thing. Uh, He's waiting or he's working uh, on your heart. He's working on your heart. See, at the end, God is teaching you to desire him, to seek him, to long for him more than the thing you're asking him for. Do you want him more than the thing that you're waiting for? More than your promotion? More than a child? More than healing in your life, more than whatever that you're asking God for. Do you long for him? Do you wait for him? Do you seek him? Is he enough for you? Or is he just a means to an end of you seeking something else? You know, when the Israelites would go worship at the temple, they would sing certain songs. They were called Psalms of Ascent. In fact, as they came up the southern steps and they they literally uh, rose up those steps onto the platform, onto the, the open air where the, where the worship would take place, where the sacrifice would be offered on the Temple Mount area. They would sing these certain psalms, psalms of ascent. One of them is Psalm 130. And let me just read to you what it says. It says, I wait for the Lord. My whole being waits. And in his word, I put my hope. I wait for the Lord like the watchman wait for the morning. Like the watchman wait for the morning. You know, the watchman would stand on the tower on the, on the city wall and he would watch to make sure no enemies are coming. But the guy that got the night shift, he would just be waiting. Many times waiting for his shift to be over. It would be dark, can't see hardly anything. But then all of a sudden it would start to get a little lighter a little lighter, a little lighter. And then just on the horizon, there would be a, a slit of a pink and then orange and then red as the sun would come up. He waited longing for the sun, waiting, expecting the sun. And David said, that's how I wait for the Lord. I wait expecting. I wait longing. I wait seeking for him. Listen, could it be that you're in a season of waiting because God wants to do something in your own heart? Could it be that you're asking him so much for this one thing that what he really wants you to do is just want him to be satisfied in him? See, you were created to know him, to be satisfied in him, that he is your hope and he is your joy, even if that thing you're waiting for never comes to fruition. Is he enough? There's a promise in the Bible for those who wait. If you are a waiter today, then let me encourage you with this one verse. It's out of Lamentations chapter 3, verse 25. And it says this, The Lord is good to those who wait for him, to the soul who seeks him. The Lord is good. To those who wait for him. It doesn't say the Lord is good after the waiting is over. It says the Lord is good in the waiting. If you seek him, then you will find him. You can find peace and you can find hope in the waiting when you set your eyes on Jesus, the author of our hope. Listen, while you're waiting, God is working. God is working while you are waiting. He was working in Zachariah's life. He was working in Elizabeth's life. And he's working in your life. He has not forgotten you. He hears your prayers. 
but he's working on you and he's working around you in his timing and for his good. And this is the time to trust him and to wait on him and to set your eyes on him, on him alone. I want you to bow your heads with me for just a minute. Maybe you're here today and you say, Craig, you know, the problem is I'm waiting, but I really don't know the Lord like you're talking about. Listen, the gospel is very clear, very simple, very simple. You look at this Bible and go, man, it's so thick, it's so big, I can't really understand it all. No, it's actually really quite simple. The Bible from cover to cover just is this one simple story called the gospel. And it starts off with the fact that you were created to know God and to walk with him and be satisfied in him. That's why you were made. That's why you're on this planet. But the Bible also tells the truth about us that we were wayward and that we went our own way and that we sinned against God and our fellowship with God is broken because of our sin. And that we cannot save ourselves and we can't fix our own problem. But in our lost state, in our wayward state, when we could not save ourselves, God sent his own son, Jesus. Jesus, the Savior, to be born in a manger at just the right time. And he came to show us the Father, and he came to point us to the Father, but he came to be a sacrifice. And on the cross, he became your sacrifice and mine. On the cross, he took on your sin, all your waywardness, all the things you've done that have separated you from God. He took it on himself as if he did it. And he died. He died in your place. And then he was buried and he rose again on the third day and he offers new life and new hope to any who will trust in him. And so maybe today, what you really need is hope. And that hope is only found in Jesus. And maybe you've never given your life to Christ. I want to give you a chance to do that right now. I'm going to pray just a simple prayer. In our early service, we had many people that raised their hands and prayed to receive Christ for the very first time. And maybe that's you. Maybe you've never truly given your life to Christ. If I were to ask you, when did you give your life to Christ? You would not be able to give me a time or a place. I want to give you an opportunity right now to nail that down to say yes to Jesus. So I'm going to pray a simple prayer of faith. And I'm just going to ask you to lift up your hand and say, Pastor, pray for me. I'll see that hand and I'll lead you in a prayer right where you're seated. I'm going to call you out in any way. But as you lift your hand, you're saying, Pastor, pray for me. And I'll lead you in a simple prayer of faith to ask Jesus to forgive you, to come into your life. This Jesus that John pointed to, this Jesus that Zechariah and Elizabeth looked forward to, whose hope was found in, I I can point you to him. So with your heads bowed, if you're here today and you need Christ in your life, just lift up your hand right now. Pastor, pray for me and and I will lead you in a simple prayer right where you are. Just lift up your hand right now, right now. Don't be bashful. God's moving in your heart, stirring in your heart right now. Just lift up your hand. Pastor, pray for me. All right. All right. Thank you. Pastor, pray for me. I need Christ. I don't know for sure that I'm right with God, but I want to know for sure. Don't delay. God may have brought you here for this very moment. Anybody else? Pastor, pray for me. I need Jesus. Okay. All right, you put your hand down now. Just pray the simple prayer with me. Dear Lord, I know that I've sinned against you. I know I've gone my own way. But I believe that Jesus died on a cross for me. I believe he rose again from the dead for me. And so I'm asking you now, please forgive me. Please wash me clean. I want to know you. I want to walk with you. And so today, I'm trusting you now. Today, I I turn from my sin to follow you, Jesus. And I want to follow you all the days of my life. Thank you, Lord, for your grace and mercy in my life. 
Father, I thank you that in every season of life and every season of waiting in our life, Lord, you're using it as an opportunity for us to trust you. Lord, you are working while we are waiting. And so, Lord, as a watchman waits for the morning, we wait for you. We long for you. We seek you. Lord, I pray for all those in this room that are waiting right now that you would give them perseverance and patience. Lord, I pray that you would stir up their faith to trust you and your timing in their life. Lord, I pray that you would grow a desire for you in their heart, that they would love you more than anything else in the world. And that, Lord, in their hopeless moments, that you would give them great hope. God, thank you that you don't leave us to ourselves. But that in every season, you're working, Lord. We love you. And we worship you now.